Great. Thank you, Chris. Oops, didn't stop. Thank you, Chris. That's a good process, wasn't it? Play the board. All right. Um, welcome to everybody. It's uh, Tara and Simon's last meeting meeting with us anyway, so a bit of a shame. Hurry back. Um, all right, Corinthians, if you would open there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. Now, Paul writing, of course, and he, he says this, For I have received of the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, I know you've heard those few scriptures many, many, many times. Uh, pretty much, uh, if I'm doing communion, I will read out that little passage and we 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 do that and we remember it. We remember uh, the Lord's uh, sacrifice as we're sort of um, asked to do, commanded to do there. And uh, obviously it's a, a thing we do uh, reverently. Um, we do it, uh, you know, seriously. We do it with thanksgiving. We do it obviously remembering uh, what the Lord uh, went through um, and, what, and what it means for us. And, and it's a good thing that we... That we do, the Lord has, has set that up uh, uh, for us to uh, to remember it in that way, and we recognise, I guess, the blessings that have come from that very sacrifice. Uh, and normally, when we read it uh, at communion time, we we sort of stop there, sort of verse twenty six. But it goes on to say some uh, other things that are, I guess, equally as important. Obviously, it's in God's word. Uh, in verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we should judge ourselves uh, we should we should not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened of the Lord and we should not be condemned uh, should not be condemned with the work with the world and so we sort of get that to that point every Sunday but then there's this this other bit about the examination of our of ourselves and um, perhaps it's a thing that we don't often consider, maybe we don't consider it as often uh, uh, as we should, which is this this examination of ourselves. You sort of think of you sort of think of life. It's sort of Nikki got me thinking about this this that test that she does for the sign language test. And there's you know you need to be licensed. You need to you can't just there's no point me rocking up tomorrow at the school and going, okay, I'm, I'm a sign I'm gonna do something. I just can't do it. I've got no idea. Uh, I'm not accredited, I'm not anything in it, you know, just be just hopeless. And so we, we get examined all the time. Quite often in jobs, um, you get examined by uh, your boss, for example. They'll give you an evaluation and they'll tell you where you're doing well, where you're doing not so well, where you might improve. Uh, you think about um, school and people do, uh, obviously, examinations in uh, high school and, uh, and, and college and things like that. And, and, and it's done, A, so I guess the teachers and that can know what we're up to but there's another purpose for it too is that people can know perhaps where they are where they need to improve uh, I don't know if they do it now but we used to have mid-year exams and uh, and basically the purpose of the mid-year exam was to really give you a um, an idea of where you needed to improve what things you'd fallen down on and, and how you needed to uh, to to perhaps change your behaviour or what things you need to learn, all that, all that kind of stuff. 
And so that's from a natural point of view. From a spiritual point of view, we're obviously, we're obviously here told to examine ourselves in what? In, in spiritual things. Our relationship with the Lord, I guess, being a, a pretty high on, on the list there. That word examination, to examine yourself uh, in the Greek, means um, a test or to discern, to make, a, to make a discernment. Let a man discern himself. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, other than the Lord, the person that knows you best is you. You are the one who knows what's going on in here and what's going on in here. Better than anyone in the room, husband or wife or kid or whatever it is, however close that relationship might be in, <clears throat> in the natural sense, the person who knows you best, apart from the Lord, is, is you. And so the best person to do the examination, let a man examine himself and understand himself. Um, uh, people often say that, to, that the harshest judge of anybody should be yourself. If you're going to judge yourself, then do it, uh, do it uh, honestly, do it, uh, do it uh, correctly, do it reverently. Of course, uh, uh, like the school thing, if you do a mid-year exam and you don't do so well in it, and then uh, and you then have the opportunity to get things right, and there's a, a, a better time coming towards the end of the year, and you'll hopefully, if you do the right thing, will get a better result later on. Well, it's kind of, you know, it's true in life in general, but it's certainly important in our spiritual life. As we do these things, as we judge ourselves, not the sort of, the idea is not to sort of judge yourself and go, well, there I am, I'm hopeless, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lost cause. That, that's not the idea of examining at all. The idea of the examination is that we are constantly aiming to get it right, to look in the Word of God, to, <clears throat> to see it as a mirror. The Word of God is often referred to, I guess, as a mirror by people. And to, to look in it and say, okay, here are some things that, you know, I can, I can do better. I can, I can uh, um, you know, whatever it might be meeting attendance, not that that occurs for anybody here, but things like that, you know, prayer life, uh, uh, reading your Bible, all that kind of stuff. We, we all know those things. In fact, uh, it's so important <clears throat> that in the very next chapter, when Paul wrote to these people again, in 2 Corinthians 13, he said this, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. That word prove there also could have been translated examine. Examine your own self, test your own self. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates or, or, or rejected. It's interesting, the Amplified, how that sort of brings it out. I'll read that Second Corinthians verse um, from the Amplified there. It says, examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you are holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. Test and prove yourselves, not Christ, do, do you not yourselves realize and know by an ever-increasing experience that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are, are counterfeits, disapproved, on trial, and rejected? That word um, reprobates there. And so, and so the idea is that what fruits are we bringing? What is the results of this relationship um, that, we, that we have uh, with, uh, with the Lord there? The examination process here, it, it implies, when I read it anyway, it implies that it's more than a cursory glance. You know, it's not like, am I doing it right? Yeah, I'm doing it right, and walking off. It's not that. It's when you go into an examination, it's not like you think, oh, I'll just have a quick glance at the questions, and if I feel like answering any of them, I will. If I don't, I'll leave. You know, you obviously can't do that. You go in and you, you read each question thoroughly and you, you do you do your exam, you know. It's not it's not something that we do on the run. And this examination of our of our soul, if you like, is obviously even more important than that. It's not something that's done on the run, but it's a thorough uh, a thorough process, I guess. You think about the you, you go you go have your annual checkup or something and you uh, you go to the doctor's office and they're gonna do some some examination of you. You don't want them to do it from the other side of the room and just sort of looking at you doing saying, yes, you look okay to me. You, you want them to do some more stuff, maybe some tests or some, you know, put a stethoscope on your back, breathe here, breathe. There. You want them to do something. You want to see some action of this examination. And I think God 
is is very much the same. That it's not just a it's not just a casual thing. It's something that's that's more deliberate than that. All right, let's uh, we'll move on now. We'll go back to Matthew chapter seven. Verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, you, you'll know them. Now, we often read these verses, and, uh, you know, I guess we, we think of a lot of things. Perhaps we think of religion out there, you know, and the... A few there be that find it, and all these sorts of things, and, and false prophets, and, and we know there's there's so much false teaching in the uh, in, in the world and in, and in religion. There's so much, uh, you know, it'll all be all right, and uh, just give your heart to the Lord, and all this sort of thing, all, all completely made up stuff. And uh, um, we sort of think of those things, and you know, good trees bringing forth uh, uh, good fruits, and all that kind, all that kind of stuff. But in a lot of ways, it's also talking about ourselves, that let's examine ourselves to see what fruit we are bearing, what kind of tree am I? We can look at the world, we know what kind of tree the world is. Uh, it's, it's corrupt in, the, in every way. But um, let's examine ourselves to see what fruit we're bearing. You know, it says there in verse 20, by their fruits you will know them, we could sort of swap that around a little bit and say, by our fruits, we will be known. What kind of fruits are we doing? And, and there's lots of questions that, that, we, that we have um, in, a, in a small assembly like this. Uh, obviously, I mean, every person virtually gets asked to do nearly every job at some point or another, <clears throat> uh, except, except preaching. There's really three of us that are doing that. But anyway, other than that, People are doing lots and lots of, of, of stuff. But I know that in, in, in bigger fellowships from time to time, there are a number of people whose sole job is to come and sit on a chair and then go home. That's all they do. Uh, uh, 25 years, it's, that's, that's what they do. And, uh, you know, there, there's, there's got to be an examination there, sort of what I'm getting at. Are we an asset to our assembly or a liability? You know, hallelujah, we're in a great position. We've got 100% assets. Uh, if the balance sheet of the company that I work for was, was as good as the balance sheet of the assembly, it would be great. You know, we're, we're assets to our assembly. Do I give as much as I can? Whatever the as I can is, you know what, you know how much that is. Uh, um, every, everything we do is a window, a portal to our spiritual well-being. It, it, it sort of reveals stuff to ourselves probably most of the time. You know, do we do we engender faith or weakness? Uh, are we encouraging or, or not? Uh, all of those sorts of things. Am I excited about my my walk in the Lord? Is our life in the Lord exactly that? Our life in the Lord. That's sort of where it, where it stops. You know, I've told you this story before a few times. I know, but quite often, uh, even now after all these years, people ask me, how do you go not being with your family? I said, basically everybody I'd ever met for the first 46 years of my life are 10,000 miles away. And I always give them exactly the same answer. My family is here. It's in this room. This, this is my family. There are people that I grew up with in Adelaide, but my family is actually in this room. And uh, I, I'm sure they don't particularly understand it all the time when I say that, but um, that's that's the that's the that's the truth. That's how it, that's how it is. That's how we are to feel. That's that's sort of part of this process too. Verse twenty one. 
Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Talk is cheap. Lots of people are out there going, oh, we're serving the Lord. Well, how are you doing that? Well, I gave my heart to him. Well, he doesn't want that. You're giving him something he doesn't he doesn't want. And then you give him a present, you think, oh, that's nice. <laughs> you sort of smile nicely, put it in the drawer, never look at it again. You know? The Lord has got a, a plan and a purpose. We can't change it. We can't, we can't make it. You know? If we want to know, if we want to be a follower of Jesus, if you're going to follow somebody, then find out what that person um, requires. Find out what they what they want. And, and that's what we do every time you pray, every time you hear the gifts, every time you hear a talk, every time you come to a meeting, every time you have fellowship with a meal around a table like we did last night. All of those things are part of this whole examination process. You know, we, we, we see it, we see that, we see that through. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? We're doing all this stuff. It's just not the right stuff. You know, I, I said to Rebecca last night, having been a person who hasn't gone to church like ever, it amazes me that so many people will just go along with whatever the bloke out the front says. You know, uh, make a decision for Christ and all will be well. And nobody questions it. It's amazing to me. They just go, oh, okay then. That's what I'll do then. They just, I don't know why they, why, why they, why they do it, you know. But the reason that they do it, and Michael sort of brought it out too last night, smooth sayings, tell us easy things to uh, to, uh, to 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 listen to. Um, have we not done this? Have we not done that? Look look at all this great stuff that we're doing. And what does the Lord say in verse twenty three? And then I'll profess unto them, I never. That work iniquity. He goes on to talk about the wise man building his house on a rock and the, the, uh, the uh, foolish man building his house uh, on, on, on the sand. And uh, obviously, we want to be that wise person building his house upon a rock. Unfortunately, I've known lots of people over the years that started off with a rocky foundation and over the years sledgehammered it away to replace it with a sandy one. It's amazing that people would, would do that. So obviously the encouragement is keep building on the rock, keep building on the firm, on the firm foundation. Don't be one of those that's given a firm foundation and then gets out their pick and shovel and picks it away and then brings in a load of sand and puts it on there and says, now I've got a foundation. Lots of people, unfortunately, do that. When you buy a house, for example, one of the things that you do is you get an inspection done and you get a guy in and he, crawls in the crawl space and he goes in the attic and he turns all the appliances on and he looks at the floor and the substrate, all that, does all that stuff and gives you a report. He examines the house before you, you buy. And uh, you flick through that thing. One of the things that you really take note of is this thing here, the foundation. You look at this report, the one we got for this place, I don't know how long it was, it was 60 pages or something. And a photo look very detailed. And you look at it and you go, first thing, look at the foundation. Because if the report comes back and says, buddy, this foundation is so bad, this house could fall down at any minute. It doesn't matter if it's got lovely chandeliers in it, does it? It does not matter. It's, it's irrelevant. The walls are nice. The layout's good. It's got a nice fireplace. But it could fall down any minute because the foundation is so bad. Who's going to buy that house? Who's going, to, who's going to be interested in that in that in that house? No, nobody. And so, um, you know, we're the same. If we're going to be doing any building, uh, and the Lord wants us to do that, He wants us to grow and, and build and all those good things, um, then we have to examine the foundation, examine our foundation, examine our fruit. What are we building on it? What sort of material are we using? When we're going to build a uh, uh, an extension to a house. You know, you don't want to use uh, the worst possible material that will fall down. It might be cheap, but it won't be any good. You want to you want to make sure that we're building, when you build a house, you want to build it properly. Uh, you want to plan a little bit. And, and our walk in the Lord is, is exactly, exactly the same. 
of course, we're we're uh, accountable to the law. We're we're accountable to him. We're accountable to ourselves. We're accountable to to each other, you know. And so, quite often, uh, from I guess many platforms, you'll be talked about faith and and, uh, and uh, fruit and giving over your burdens and how to walk and how to be good test all, all of these sorts of things and and uh, lots and lots of uh, of talk that you can have. And if we're going to build, then we need to be obviously listening to those things and, and taking them on board and and, uh, and applying them and, and, and doing them, all of those all of those sorts of things. It was interesting that after all this, the people were impressed because it says they were astonished at his doctrine. But he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. When you get examined at a school with your teachers and stuff, then you know those people have authority. The, the mark that they give you is going to determine, the older you get certainly, it's going to determine more and more things. What college can I get into for starters? What 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 job will I end up getting when I'm 40 years old? All this all this sort of stuff. They, they can they can those things are, are important. They've got authority over you. Wow, how much more authority has this man got? Jesus Christ. The the, 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 the mark, if you like, that he gives you, yeah, it's more important than any mark you're ever going to get. You know? Uh, you might get a pass mark at school, and that's that's good. That's great. Yes, achieved what you needed to achieve. Well done, you know, you good and faithful student. But we want to hear more importantly than that, don't we? Well done, that good and faithful servant of mine. You've examined yourself. You're bringing forth that fruit. Okay, well, we're going to move now uh, to Peter, chapter 3. Verse 9, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, with, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Lord obviously wants people to be part of this whole process. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein, wherein dwelleth righteousness. That word there, looking for, in, uh, in the Greek, is, uh, is expectation. It's not just we're sort of waiting for it. Um, you're waiting for it expectantly. You're waiting for it uh, hope. You know, you're sort of waiting for it with a hope in your heart. Part of the examination process is the expectation, A, of God, certainly, but also perhaps the expectation of ourselves. You know, we want to we want to sort of uh, have a, we want to set the bar high, don't we? I guess uh, one principle, I heard this many years ago, uh, a good principle to observe is, would I act like that if Jesus was standing next to me? I forget who, taught, who said that to me. Uh, would I have acted like that if Jesus was standing next to me? And then the thing after that is, well, He's even closer than that. He's closer than standing next to you. He's in you. The Holy Spirit is directing us every minute of every day, leading us and guiding us if we'll go there. Did I act well in that situation? We've all had times where we've done things or said things or whatever it is that you can think of. Gosh, I could have done, done that better. I really could have. I, 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 if I had my time again, I would not do it that way. You know, we've all had that. Would would the Lord be pleased with that action? Did the spirit shine through? Did I encourage somebody? If there was a new people, a new person there, would they have said, wow, I want to be like that? 
you know. And uh, hallelujah, I guess we've all done time, had things where that has been true, but other times where perhaps it hasn't been true. Did my words encourage the saints? Did they encourage our brothers and sisters? It's what we obviously want to be uh, doing. These are some of the things perhaps that the examination process might might reveal. Cause and effect. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we can't control, you know, the cause. Sometimes the cause is completely out of your control. But the effect is always you. The effect is always in, a, in our cause. What will I do? How will I how will I react to situation X? What, what, will, it, what will it be? In verse 14, he says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, be, be, be vigilant, that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Of course, that doesn't mean that you've never done anything wrong. You know, we know that, uh, that that's not the case. It's exactly the opposite, in fact. But in Romans, we read one of the, one of the, great, one of the great verses, you know, there is no condemnation. I'm going to actually read it so that I don't, I don't muck it up. Uh, you don't need to turn there, but it's in, in Roman note, of course. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the flesh, but not uh, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Yes, we'll do things wrong. Yes, we'll we, we might do the examination and think, wow, I better pull my socks up here. But hallelujah, that doesn't mean the Lord's sort of, you know, pointing his finger down at you and beating you with a stick. It doesn't mean that at all. He wants to lift you up. He wants to He wants to uh, uh, help us in every single way. And uh, when we do that, and we do that examination, and we realize perhaps there are things that we might want to change, well, the Lord is 100% on board with that. He will help you in every every single way. It's a, it's a great thing. There's, there's no condemnation if we're walking in the Spirit. The Lord is there to... To, to help and to uplift and to uh, and to uh, and to help us to grow and to get back on the right track, you know. Uh, I think Simon was saying last night in the testimony that I heard that uh, you know he, he he went to somebody and and uh, that person's thought was, well, let's get you back in fellowship wherever that wherever that was. Well, imagine the Lord even more so, you know. Come on back, you know. Uh, examination going on and uh, the Lord totally on board with with uh, blessing us as we uh, as, as we do that as we do examine ourselves uh, Proverbs chapter 3 Proverbs chapter 3 Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. So one of the great uh, pieces of advice, of the many pieces of advice in the word of God. If we want, if we want our way, if we want our path laid out for us and, and, and followed, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. 100%. Uh, heart, soul, mind, and strength, as it were, and lean not to your own understanding. You know, sometimes, you know, if we were to, if we were to mark our own um, exams, maybe we would give ourselves a much higher mark than what we really need to. Um, lean not to that understanding. You know, really, really sort of take on board the things of God in all your ways. He, he uses these absolutes all the time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not, never, to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honour the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. The Lord wants to bless, he wants to bless his people. But then he goes on after the trusting and acknowledging and and uh, and bounds and think of that he goes my son despise not the chastening of the lord neither be weary of his correction 
Christ. Whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as a father the son in whom he delights. Happy is the man that finds wisdom and the man that gets understanding. The merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than, than fine gold. The Lord will correct us from time to time. And we all know that. We all have it, I'm sure. And it's not because he doesn't, he doesn't love us for the opposite reason. It's because he does love us that he does it. Um, um, you know, Chris and Michael, who are fathers of, of little kids, I'm sure, on the rare occasions where it's required, that they correct their children. And it's not because, it's not because oh, they don't love them, that's why they do it. It's the opposite reason. They do love them. They do want them to, uh, to, to see, you know, and maybe a better way that, that, that they should go. And as they get older, perhaps you can sort of do a little, a little more of that. Uh, my father was not very good at many things. He, he, was, he was sort of okay with his hands and that. The best thing he was at was correction. His number one thing was correction. Uh, he was really the exceller at, uh, at correction. He did it often, and he did it to, in our mind, whether we needed it or not. <laughs> so so that's, that's, that's what he did. He had no issue with correction. And you know what? Neither does God. He has no issue with correcting us. It's not as if he's going to say, oh, they need correction there, but I think I'll back off. He will never do that. He'll always correct us because he loves us. There's such a great reward at the end, end of it, isn't it, that he, he doesn't want us to be, he doesn't want us to, uh, to, to not have that understanding. It's interesting that as soon as he talks about uh, chastening and correction, either side of those verses he talks about wisdom. All of those things really are, are sort of married, married together. It's no coincidence at all that, that correction and wisdom are tied up with, with each other. The wisdom that we show is not in the receiving of the correction, because we just receive it. The wisdom is our reaction to it, like the cause and effect I said before. The Bible says we're called to be malleable. You know, we're, we're clay in the potter's hands, we, we read. In Psalm 26, it says, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me or test me. Try my reins and my heart. And hallelujah, that's, that's, what, that's what the Lord does. The great thing is, of course, is that the Lord, he's not, he's not worried. The Lord isn't disappointed in us when we need correction. It's not, as if he's, it's not as if he says, oh, here they go, they need correcting now. It's not like that at all. He, he expects that, that we will need correction. He writes, there's a fair bit in the Bible about this correction uh, uh, having to happen and our reaction to it and all of those sorts of things. He doesn't care that we need correction. What he cares about is the reaction. What will we, what will we, what will we do? Um, um, in Psalm 62, it says, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. That's where our expectation is from. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. The, the one we turn to, hopefully first, will be, will be the Lord there. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go to uh, Titus chapter 2. We might sort of finish there. Titus chapter 2. And verse 1, Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviour as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncor uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, 
that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Saviour, uh, in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man despise thee. This is an interesting chapter here about, I guess a lot of it is about behaviour, expectations of, of behaviour. Now, how many of us can look through this list and go, yep, done that 100% of the time? <laughs> not one. Not one of us can look, look at those, look at that thing. Our expectation is that uh, we would attain to these things. That's our, expect, that's our expectation. And so, because we often don't, perhaps, we, we, we do that examination and find out what, what things should I be doing? What could I I, I improve on? One thing we have an expectation of is this hope that he talks about, looking for that blessed hope. That's exactly the same looking for as in Second Peter, an expectation of a blessed hope, the glorious appearing of, our, of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We have a hope that we know. Uh, they say, what's that saying? We have a no-so hope, not a hope-so hope. You know, we don't, uh, we don't sort of sit around with our fingers crossed, you know, hoping that we're doing this or that or the right thing or whatever. We don't do any of that. We have, we have a hope that's, that's inbuilt into us, ingrained into us by the Holy, Holy Spirit. And so because of all of these things that we read here, we have a responsibility to ourselves and to each other to uphold the things of God, to uphold the gospel in everything that, that we do. Um, in the world, uh, I know that there are people out there that have an at-home me and a church me. You know, they're lovely on Sundays. If you meet them, they're fantastic people on Sundays. But if you see them at home or whatever, then they're sort of two that they're two people. There's an at-home me, an at-work me, there's a, an at-meeting me, an at-church and at-church me. And of course, that's not what, what the Lord wants us to have at all. Some might say the expectation is too great. They do the examination and they look at themselves and think, it's too tough, I just can't do it. The expectation that was on Jesus as he was led to the cross in Calvary. That pressure from a natural point of view is something that none of us will ever experience, I'm sure. Um, is the expectation too great? When we do the examination, will we go, well, I can't do it. It's just too difficult. Well, hallelujah. Unlike Jesus, who had to go through it, you know, he will see you through in every way. So continue on. Do what you know to be right. Shine your light. Continue every day, really, to examine yourself. And in that examination process, what happens is you will grow. You will grow from that examination. You will, you will see. You'll get a better appreciation. You'll have a closer relationship with the Lord. All of those things come from that examination. There's quite a bit about examine me, prove me, test me in the Scriptures. And it's not there for no reason. It's there because the Lord wants us to uh, to do that. Is the bar set very high? Yep, the bar is set high. You know, and you know why? You know why it's set that high? It's set that high because Jesus set it there. That's who set the bar. He's the one who put it where it is. And uh, you know, a lot of people think, "Gee, that bar's high," and they walk under it and they go. Well, look, I'm on the other side of the bar. It must be all right. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way at all. You know, 
We have to attain to those things. The bar is set high because Jesus set it there. And uh, it's up to us to do that examination and go, there's the bar. I've got to attain to those things. Now, when the Lord comes back, will we have attained to every single thing? No. But will we be growing? Will we be in that in that process? Will we have that expectation that we're that we're going to do this or do that or whatever it is that we might that we might um, reveal to our, to ourselves? There is no condemnation for those who are walking in the Spirit because it's all part of that growing uh, growing process. Keep on that uh, that foundation. Don't chip away at it. Build on it because if we do. Hallelujah, we're going to pass the ultimate examination of all. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And all the people said, Amen. All right. Um, if somebody could turn that off, that would be great. Thank you, Chris. Um, all right, Michael's going to hand out the... Uh,